Okay, well, let's move on from, um, we, we spent some time emphasizing the difference between effects and corrections on uh, our previous video. And uh, now we're going to talk about one of the final effects corrections that we need to make to the observed gravity uh, in order to eliminate those non-geological influences that we've uh, we've talked about. One of the you know the most common way of doing this is to use a looping survey approach. Um, you begin your survey by making observations at a base station. Uh, you know the base stations can you know be set up periodically as you go through your survey. Uh, the idea is that uh, the base station probably shouldn't be more than an hour uh, or so away from your last survey point so that in general you can get out, measure a few stations, and then back to your uh, base station within about a, uh, an hour's time. So the idea is that uh, uh, you start off at the, you know, at the beginning of your survey, you make a measurement at your local base station, uh, you go out and you measure uh, uh, a few, um, make a few observations at points along your survey route, and then you return to the base station and remeasure the acceleration due to gravity. Now, of course, there, there's the actual acceleration due to gravity here does not, you know, is not changed in any geological sense. There's no re geological reason for the change, but it will change due to the positions of the sun and the moon relative to um, your location on the uh, on the surface and it's those kinds of changes that you want to eliminate so by periodically reoccupying the base station <clears throat> you can see how those tide and drift effects vary through the through the course of your survey so that's the uh, that's the general idea. Start at your base, go out and make a few observations. Maybe maybe as you start out you can only take in about four observations and then it's time to return to your base station to remeasure G, track the tide and the drift. And the drift can be due to mechanical, long-term mechanical uh, strain on uh, the instrumentation. It can also be to, due to uh, Temperature variations, which are usually, you know, the, the uh, gravimeters are usually well insulated uh, to avoid that sort of thing. But you, you have to uh, incorporate uh, some instrument drift usually. So you loop and return until stations become too far away. You get out here and you really can't make it back in time uh, to get a sensible idea of how the tide and the drift are influencing your measurements. So. So this is an example of a tide and drift curve that extends over a 24-hour period. And it comes from a paper by Wolf. Uh, <clears throat> these are the base station variations of G, so you can see that they were just continuously monitoring the variations in the acceleration due to gravity at the base station during the course of a day. And you can see that there is kind of a linearly upward increasing trend to these variations. They seem to uh, gradually rise through time and that could be due to some mechanical strain on the uh, on the springs within the instrument uh, <clears throat> producing some slight change in the elongation of the spring so that um, it's actually greater than it was uh, a day ago. And uh, there are two curves down here, which you can see this drift has been removed, and we're just looking at the tidal variations here. And so these are drift corrected. <clears throat> and the, these are, uh, curve C is referred to as the observed gravity variation. D is the calculated gravity variation. But the difference between D and C is that in D, you treat the Earth as though it were completely rigid and unyielding. And, you know, in fact, the Earth also deforms. So you're a little bit further away from the Earth during these tidal highs, gravity highs, than you are during the lows. There's actually some deformation. This dashed line does not incorporate that 
deformation. So these timelines mark intervals of about four hours. And I think you can see that over a <clears throat> four hour period, very often the changes are going to be linear. Uh, however, you, you typically don't go more than a couple hours, and I think you can see why. Uh, probably during the course of your survey, you want to get a feeling for the daily variation in the cycles. And during periods like this, of course, you're, you're going to have errors in there if you go a couple hours. Uh, so you need to kind of pay attention to, uh, to <clears throat> how long you stay out and whether you can get along with a longer get by with a longer period of time between reoccupations or whether you have to reoccupy at a shorter that can actually vary during the course of a day so that's something that you need to take into consideration so. um, here's a simple simple example that we're going to go through um, you know you've you've gotten out as far as you can go and you really can't get back in a timely manner so you're saying well I need to establish a new base station so you need to tie that in. That would just be like correcting an additional point along your survey, more or less, although you might go back and forth a couple times. Um, <clears throat> so you want to establish a new base station. Let's call that base station 6. And, uh, you know, base stations are usually tied into a main base. And, you know, the, the main base could, could be a, a position where there's a, a, an accurate measurement of the actual value of the acceleration due to gravity that you can tie back into, that you can tie all your data into and cross-check with. So these base stations are things that you can just set up as you go through your survey. They may be tied back into a <clears throat> main, main base, uh, some place where the absolute uh, value of the acceleration due to gravity is known. And uh, so we're just going to do it for one base station. We're going to establish this uh, base station 6, for example. So here's the general problem. We start off at 8 a.m. Uh, we go from base station 5 to base station 6, uh, further out in our survey. Uh, when we first measure at 8 a.m., we measure the acceleration due to gravity at the uh, base station 5. It's 5.3 milligals relative to the main base station, to that measured at the main base station in your survey, which we would assume would be, you know, zero uh, in this example. And, but, you know, in, in fact, it's always going to be 5.3 milligals relative to the main base. So uh, we start off with a measurement. We know that it's 5.3 milligals relative to the main base. Uh, we go to base station six. We take a measurement 53 mi minutes later. Let's say it, take a, it takes us 53 minutes to get out here to base station 6. And um, your reading then is 4.3 milligals, but 53 minutes of time have, have elapsed. And you know that the acceleration due to gravity at both base station 5 and base station 6 will have changed during that 53 minutes of time, right? So the sun and the moon are at different locations. Uh, so you return to base station five, and you want to, you know, figure out how much things have changed. Uh, you stop for gas along the way. Uh, makes the problem simple. You get back to base station five and make an additional measurement at 10 a.m. So 120 minutes uh, have elapsed uh, since your initial measurement. Now the reading at base station five during that period of time dropped two milligals. So the question for you, and you might you know, pause the tape at, at this point, would be to determine what is the acceleration at base station 6 relative to the main base. So, the easiest, one of the easiest way to do this is to plot up the actual drift. So, we assume that the drift was, you know, approximately linear during this 120 minute period of time. We can see that at the main base, the acceleration due to gravity dropped by 2 milligauss from 5.3 milligauss to 3.3 milligauss. When we made a measurement at the new base, <clears throat> the uh, uh, value at the new base was 4.3 milligauss. So would, should we think that it's actually 1 milligauss less than that at the base? No. 
the trend line here, the drift, really represents a value of 5.3 milligauss. Uh, because we know that the, the, the acceleration due to gravity at the base station 5 really didn't change relative to the main base. So any point along this, any, any point in time along this drift curve uh, will have a value of 5.3 milligauss. So this is a little over a tenth of a milligauss less than 5.3 milligauss. Just looking at it graphically, we expect it to be on the order of about you know, 1.1, 1.2, or 0 0.1, 0 0.12 milligauss less. So these graphs are kind of useful, you know, in a practical sense to give you some perspective. Uh, the value, the acceleration due to gravity along this line is constant. Uh, the value that we're interested in, the corrected value would be to determine this value here. Uh, this is just a straight line. So we calculate its slope. This is just your delta G delta T. This is how the acceleration due to gravity varies over that 120 minute period of time. Uh, you've dropped 2 milligauss in 120 minutes, so it's a negative 0 0.0167 milligauss per minute <clears throat> times uh, time. If you want to know what it is at any point in time along this, uh, along these two occupations. And then the intercept is just the value uh, relative to the main base. So here we calculate the, um, you know, the, the gravity at uh, base station 5 at this point, uh, incorporating, you know, to the, you know a, a, as under the influence of tide and drift, is 4.415. And we've just kind of plugged into that equation there. We can see what the value of g at the base, if we could instantaneously transport ourselves back to the base station, make a measurement, we would find that it would be 4.415 milligauss. So the delta g here um, between 4.3 and 4.415 is minus 0.115. So we're, we're down 0.115. So we know that we're going to be 0.115 less than 5.5, right? In other words, the value at the new base, base station 6, will be 0.115 less than the estimated value of g at the base station. So, so uh, these curves, you know, basically don't change. If the intercept changes, you still get the get the same answer. Um, our question is, what is the acceleration due to gravity relative to the main base? And we, we know that base station 5 has a value of 5.3 milligauss relative to the main base. So the value at the base station 6 relative to the main base, which was our initial question, is 5.3 minus 0 0.115 or 5.185. So if base station 5 has value 0 relative to the main base, you know, in this case, if this was a different you know, in other words, we said base station 5 had the same uh, acceleration as the main base, you know, then, then we'd say that uh, g at the base station 6 would be minus 0 0.115. The important thing is that it's this relative difference that we're looking at. And relative to the relationship of the gravity at the previous base station to the main base in your survey. So if we look at multiple data points and think about this problem, uh, <clears throat> you know, it's, it's common to kind of think, okay, well, it was, let's say, zero milligauss at the base when we left in the morning. And now it's, um, you know, about uh, 0.55 milligauss on, on this scale over here. But it's actually more than 0.55 milligauss because there's this drift has occurred through time and 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 so we have to incorporate the drift we have to add in this case in this case uh, the difference is not going to be as great it's going to be less by the amount of the drift so um, so that in a nutshell is the tide and drift correction um, the <clears throat> Next time, uh, you know, we'll take a look at some example uh, problems and calculate um, 
the free air effect, free air correction, uh, plate correction, and uh, terrain corrections uh, for, well, well, we'll use this problem here, and we'll also take a look at uh, uh, some other problems. So uh, see you next time. Thanks for joining us.